So I have loved the martial art and idolized martial artists since I was five years old, right? As far back as I can remember. As a child of the 80s when I grew up, the only thing I ever wanted to be for Halloween any year was either Rocky or the Karate Kid. I just couldn't imagine a better story to try to embody on a day like that, where an underdog would transform into a kind of hero. And it really resonated with, a, frankly, a sensitive, weird little kid like I was, right? And I think I always assumed that by now I'd have grown up to be some sort of world kickboxing champion or like a super soldier or a ninja turtle, right? Like the shell and the thing and everything, and the whole nine yards. And I've had the opportunity to meet some combat veterans and some combat athletes. And each one, by the way, has been more impressive than the last. They, they have to lead a kind of lifestyle that demands of them sort of grit, which we've learned about, and resilience, and a dedication to their craft that just absorbs so much from them and they give so much back. But one of the things I've learned from them is that it turns out in the end that particular lifestyle just wasn't really for me, at least not at 37 years old. And yet martial art does remain today at the center of my daily life. And frankly, some days I'm left wondering why. Right? I, if I'm not training for any particular occasion, then why so much training? I teach martial art. And sometimes I look out at my students and I think, why, what are we all doing here? And getting together night after night, punching and kicking each other in the head is kind of a weird way to spend Wednesday, right? And don't get me wrong, there's plenty of self-defense reasons to study martial arts. There's plenty and they're always going to be important. Click on your newsfeed any morning, you'll find ample reasons to study martial arts. But what I mean is different. What I mean is why in the 21st century do so many of us seek out that martial art and warrior ethos as a lifestyle? Why still do so many of us in 2019 see martial art as a way of life? So in a search for answers, I decided to take a little bit of an investigative look at 2019. In the years 2013 and 2014, the Center for Disease Control did a study and found that one out of every three American adults is considered medically obese, one out of every three. For young people under the age of 19, it's one out of six. Which I get, by the way, I love cupcakes as much as more than anybody in this room, right? But the in, uh, potential tragic result, the danger of that kind of lifestyle is things like type 2 diabetes, which again, the CDC considers the number seven cause of death in the United States, or heart disease, which for so many years now has been number one. Here in 2019, we're at the virtual tip of the spear of human innovation, and technological evolution, ideas, People, relationships, information is all just one click or one tap away. And yet again, the CDC did a study in the year 2018, and they found that one out of every seven adults that they surveyed had reported taking a prescribed antidepressant medication in the last 30 days. So the Sigma group did a study using UCLA's loneliness scale. What they found was interesting was that 27% of adults that they spoke with reported feeling lost or alone or confused among their peer group. Members of Generation Z, in particular, reported feelings of isolation as high as one out of every two kids. Generation Z, if you don't know, this is the generation that was raised effectively inside of the internet, inside of social media, always putting their thoughts and their feelings out into the world, yet feeling misunderstood by their peers, one out of every two. In 2019, we have probably as much or more information about the inherent dangers in abusing drugs and alcohol. And yet 20.6 million Americans fight, battle with some sort of chemical dependency today. And I know, I'm one of them. It's been a 15 year fight, that's not an easy one. 30 Americans die every day from alcohol related car crashes and 100 from overdose. We have an opioid crisis going on in our country. Probably fair to say that number's not going anywhere anytime soon. And so perhaps it's no surprise then that as much as 50% of those that are seeking mental health services are seeking it for things related to post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. 22 US Army and military veterans commit suicide, choose to end their lives in our country every day, 22. And so, 
Perhaps it's for these reasons that if we look at this list, we can find some information. If we review these numbers, maybe we can get some usable data. We've got the, what the CDC calls the number nine cause of death in the United States, that's suicide. The number seven cause, type two diabetes. We've got the number three cause, which is accidents, and in particular, that's gonna be influenced by auto accidents and alcohol-related auto accidents. And the number one cause of death, heart disease. Do you know that homicide is done until something like 15? Which I think is interesting because it means that at least for our purposes here today, that statistically speaking, you're more likely to be attacked by your heart than somebody walking down the street. That sugar is more deadly than assault. Right? That we're perhaps more likely to be felled by our own hand than in some sort of mythical duel somewhere. And so I think it's for this reason that a lot of contemporary martial arts schools are shifting at least some of their focus away from the combat and defensive parts of self-defense and a little more towards that self component. Yeah? The organization that I'm part of, MKG International, is an example of this, and there's many others like us. Our mission statement, for example, is that we seek to help create more functional and peaceful individuals who will help to create a more functional and peaceful world. Which I admit, I think sounds better than we're here to punch and kick things on a Wednesday night, right? <laughs> uh, but I think there's truth in that, because by demystifying at least some of the traditional philosophies and creating an opportunity where the new student, the contemporary martial artist, can come through the door and choose, feel empowered to dictate their own reasons for training, right? their own context in which they seek out these ancient arts. They're enabled to find a reason to continue to come back. And in my experience so far, they have found reasons. I have four martial art brothers who amongst them have lost over a thousand pounds of body weight. A thousand pounds. I just want to let that sit. A thousand pounds. Can you imagine the kind of physical and emotional burden released back out at a loss of a thousand pounds? I have three students in the last two years who have told me that because of their time in martial art, they've been able to cycle off of their prescribed antidepressant medication. For some people, their time on the mat is almost a social outlet, an opportunity to meet and discover more of their neighbors, to find new friends from backgrounds they maybe would have ever, never been able to meet before. And for some of those groups, it's almost a type of like group therapy, right? And you know when they're in the gym, because you can hear them out there, they're really cheering each other on. First of all, when they're kicking, they're screaming like they're losing it, which is always a blast. But they're really encouraging one another, go, 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 and hit, 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 and leave it in the pads. And they do. When they go home at night, they don't bring so much of the stress of their day back to their families or to their roommates or their pets, right? They leave so much of that on the mat. And I know I'm the guy that cleans up after them. <laughs> it's true. Daily stress is like a puddle, right? It's not a pleasant thing, but I'm glad for them. For some of us, martial art is part of our chem chemical health treatment. I'm now five years alcohol-free this June. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, it, it's an unreal thing to see the way that this art can get inside of you and have an effect from the inside out. And I really don't need statistics to tell you how much this art has improved my life in that way. And I've seen time and time again for so many of us the way that this art acts as a, a kind of grief therapy, a way to handle the loss of a loved one, right? of a friend or a parent or a child. When my twin daughters were born three whole months premature, my wife and I weren't sure if they were going to make it. Day in and day out, we had to sit and watch them in that place. And yet a team of miracle workers rallied around them. We called them nurses, but they're miracle workers. Rallied around them and created an environment where those two little girls could thrive, could grow, could become strong, so that they could one day grow into whoever it is they choose to be. And yet my wife and I were still kind of stuck on the sidelines, feeling helpless, feeling alone. Like, what can we do? We just have to sit here and watch. And yet, lo and behold, a team of miracle workers rallied around us. We call them martial artists, but they're miracle workers. They rallied around us and created an environment where we could thrive, where we could support one another, right? Where we could finally find the strength and the determination to just keep pushing forward one foot in front of the other, one round after another, 
for three whole months. And so finally, my family, my new family, was united at home for the first time. Speaking of my wife, who's here today, we met in a martial arts school. We met on the mat of an MKG gym. She actually kicked me in the groin within the first five minutes of having met her, which if you ask her after this, she'll insist was an accident, but I have other feelings. Probably some kind of karma or something, I don't know what, but. <laughs> but even those things are proven possible. We own a gym together. It's located in Metro Detroit. Detroit, a fairly well-known city for a lot of different reasons, and some of them not so great. And yet, we do volunteer programs in the city of Detroit with inner city youth at a place called the Children's Center. And the Children's Center is the city of Detroit's oldest youth mental health services clinic, still running in a fantastic place. And the programming that we do there is a, a summer camp program where we use Muay Thai kickboxing as a, a kind of mindfulness-based fitness activity. And in these classes, young people come together who have been the victims of severe trauma or violence. Kids that are dealing with mental health challenges or maybe on the autism spectrum. Young people from the city of Detroit in the foster care system. All coming together in one class, one program, to work together to learn to use their bodies to use their minds, to challenge themselves and one another, and yet still work together as a team. When we do this, we get to reframe some of the violence that they're exposed to in those classes, and instead make it play, make it activity. And the result is that they lift each other up, they high-five each other, they're sweating, they're smiling, they're having a great time. And to me, that's an awful lot of application for one activity. Now, when you go out of the school, or you go out of the dojo, and into the neighborhood, and a fight happens, you have an opponent. But inside the school, again, when we reframe this, that's not an opponent, it's a partner. Right? And I think that word really matters, partner. You say sparring partner, or training partner. And a partnership is a really specific kind of relationship, because it is indeed a real relationship. And relationships like that require authenticity. And authenticity with another person requires trust. And trust requires that you be trustworthy. Right? You have to really show up for something like that. Because with a training partner, your job is to point out the gaps in each other's game. Right? You're really strong here, but your weaknesses are here. And yeah, you might point those out by sticking your glove in there. And it doesn't always feel the best. But what's funny is I almost never hear anybody complain in my classes. Because it's a different dynamic in a relationship like this. My training partners don't know me as a role. They don't know me as a spouse or as a father or a son, as an employer or employee. They just know me as the person that's there helping them to thrive and succeed because they have to show up and help me with that same thing. You see, your martial art family doesn't really care about things like your socioeconomic status or your Facebook status. They don't care how many likes or followers that you might have. All they care is that you find the courage to show up, to walk through the door on your first day of classes. They can recognize it because they had to find that same courage on their first day of classes, and we all had a first day of classes. Even Bruce Lee had a first day of class. Now, at the end of the day, I'm not sure if we're creating more functional and peaceful world around us. But I do know that every night I have the opportunity to watch people create a more functional, more peaceful life for themselves. And I know that they take that home with them after class, to their families, to their neighborhoods, their communities, to their churches, to their businesses. And that ripple effect that happens, that's where real change does take place. I know how martial art has changed my life. And so I know how martial art has changed the world around me. And if you can work for somebody like me, you can work for anybody in this room. And so I hope that if you're considering taking your first step onto the mat someday, that you remember to find your own reason to train, and that you never forget that that reason will always matter. Thank you.